length for appeal of triples is 5,040 changes, but you need to ring 5,041 rows. You start and you end in rounds. It's a bit like a fence. The rows are the posts and the changes are the panels. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about history, the history of change ringing. In the very earliest days, change ringing only involved one pair of bells swapping at any one time. And these were called plain or single changes, very much the way we do call changes now. And many of the old systems of single changes are still rung today in Devon. An example is 60 on thirds. However, these could have been rung without the changes being called. The band would have all learnt the sequence of changes. The consequence of this type of ringing is most bells would stay in one place for longer than with modern method ringing. Here is an example which I've copied from a book called Campanologia Improved. And you can see that it's been published as columns of figures. If we zoom in a bit, we can see a little bit more clearly. I'm sorry for that this is a bit blurred, but unfortunately, I was trying to ex um, magnify these. I lose some of the definition. But in, at the beginning, we start with rounds on five. And then the first change, just one pair of bells swap over. The one and the two swap, and the three, four, and five stay in the same place. In the next change, the one and the three swap. The two stays at lead, and the four and the five stay in their respective places. And then the one and the four swap. So if you look down the columns, you can see that most of the time, the bells stay in the same place. They're not moving. It's the treble that's the one that's moving each time. And then when the treble gets to the back, the two and the three swap. And then the treble is gradually moved back down to the front, and then the two and the four swap. But each change, only one pair of bells swaps. Fabian Stedman, back in the 1600s, was the first person to publish books on change ringing. Here are details of the two main publications that he put out, Tintinologia and Campanologia. And these were mainly concerned with single change methods. Even though Stedman is, um, mainly thought of today in con con uh, conjunction with Stedman doubles and Stedman triples. He actually published more than 50 different methods. And most of these were single change methods, although he did introduce some what he called cross change methods, which involved two pairs of bells changing. Following on from Stedman's um, books in the 1600s, Campanologia Improved was published in 1702. And this was put out basically because the, um, the writers had been asked to do this because the older books, which were mainly concerned with single change methods, were by now coming out of date. Everybody wanted to ring cross change methods, doubles or also known as doubles or triple change methods, um, of which the first had been Granser, which was developed around about 1650. So the writers of Campanologia Improved introduced a number of new methods to their ringers, and these were much less static and more of a challenge to ring. Here's an example of, of one of the double change methods. This one's called Winwick doubles. And if we zoom in, we can see that, in fact, two pairs of bells swap each time. In this case, again, we start from rounds. The one and the two swap over. The three stays in the same place, and then the four and the five swap. Then in the next change, the two stays at leading, the one and the three swap, and the four and the five swap, and so on down, down the column. So in that example of Winwick doubles, we saw that each method normally had a descriptive passage and then a table of rows to examine. So these would have needed to have been carefully studied away from the tower. And people would have had to have had a good level of literacy and understanding. You no, know, not everybody had the level of education that you might expect people to have today. The descriptions are quite involved and you would have needed to have understood the descriptive terminology, you know, the specialist bell ringing terminology. 
This example was actually a lot later. This was in 1934, and it's from the book The Nine Tailors by Dorothy Sayers, where Peter Whimsey, who hasn't been ringing for some years, goes to ring at Fenchurch St Paul, and he's being reminded by one of the local ringers how to ring Kent. And we can see that there's quite a bit of specialist terminology in here, talking about a snapping lead and a slow hunt and making thirds and fourths and then laying the blows behind. And Sayers had very much taken her bell ringing knowledge from a book by Troit, which was published in 1872. So although she was writing in the 1900s, she was actually looking back at a book which was quite a bit older than that. And in fact, by the 1930s, things had moved on quite a bit. So into the, into the 1800s, we come across Jasper Snowden, and he published quite a few books for ringers, including quite a seminal one called Diagrams, which he published first in 1892. And this has been republished over the years. And in this, he had tables of rows, just as Stedman and Troit had, but there was no description Instead, he drew a red line through the path of the treble and a blue line through the path of one of the working bells. And this is now common practice. And we all talk these days about learning the blue line for something. Have you got the blue line for something? He still wrote other books with lots of descriptive text, including one I was looking at called Standard Methods, which was published in 1908, where his description of Stedman was very algebraic with lots of A's, B's and C's. Here's an example from Snowden's book of 1872, Blue Line, uh, showing the blue line of double bob. Here it is a little bit larger. We can see that the red line joins all the ones and therefore is showing the path of the treble. And the blue line, which is somewhat faded, is joining the path of the two. And it gives us something easier to hang on to than just the, the large columns of numbers, which are quite difficult. However, at the same time that Snowden was writing, John Carter was a leading Birmingham ringer. He was uh, worked in the gun trade, he was a pistol maker, and he was a uh, composer, did a lot of composing um, of peels and new methods. And he had an idea for a ringing machine. He was a very practical man, who had a lot of knowledge of um, engineering. And um, he had this idea that he should be able to make some sort of mechanism that would be able to ring methods. And one day he was on, his, on a bus on the way to Perry Bar where he was due to call appeal. And just while he was sitting on the bus, it came to him how he could make this computer work. Uh, needless to say, the peel at Perry Bar fired out uh, because he just couldn't concentrate on uh, on what he was supposed to be doing at Perry Bar. He was um, so enthused by this idea he had for a ringing machine, which was an effectively an early form of computer. But he needed to find a new way of defining methods. This was play citation. Now, as we said before, Early on, most bells stayed put and it was just one pair of bells that were swapping. As methods developed, more and more bells were moving and fewer bells were staying in the same pl place. And he found that the, the principle, could, principle could be followed, that the bells making the places actually define what the bells that are moving must do. So it became a shorthand way of writing down a method. Even so, the ringing world took until the 1950s to stop having to print half a lead of any new method. And since then, they just print the place notation in order to uh, let people know what a new method is. So place notation, as well as being the shorthand method of writing a method down, can also be used to get an understanding of the structure of a method. Some people also learn new methods by learning the place notation rather than the blue line. Though this is not very common. So moving on to place notation, what is it? And so the first thing we need to look at are the symbols that are used. The so first is a cross, or some people use a dash. And this is used to denote that all pairs of bells must swap. 
So starting from rounds and starting from the beginning of the change, we swap the first pair of bells. So the one and the two swap. We swap the second pair of bells, the three and the four swap, and we swap the final pair of bells, the five and the six. Where we have numbers, it means that the bells in those places stay in that place and the others swap. So it's not the bell name, it's the bell number. Here we're referring to the place. In this example, because I'm actually starting from rounds, it is actually bells number five, three and bell number six that stay in the same place. But the important thing here is three and six means that the bells in those places stay there. So in this case, the one and the two swap, the three stays in the same place, the four and the five swap, and the six stays in the same place. In even bell methods, the places must always be in pairs. Two bells must stay in the same place in order to leave an even number of bells available to swap. Places can be considered to be external, that is leading and lying, or internal places. If a pair of places includes one internal and one external place, then sometimes the external place is omitted. So on six bells, three six could be shown simply as three. Odd bells, must, odd places must always be accompanied by a lie and even places will be accompanied by a lead. Most methods are symmetrical. So place notation for only half the lead will be given However, the lead end needs to be stated because you can have methods which have the same half lead place notation, but a different lead end place notation. Here is an example, which is Cambridge Minor. So it could be written as it is in the first instance with crosses and with pairs of bells being, making, making the places. And then LE stands for lead end, or it could be written with dashes instead of the crosses, and only the internal places quoted. However, the first example is the most common. So for many methods, like Cambridge, alternate places will be an all change. And any places made will be right places, made at handstroke and backstroke. I mean, any of you who've been through Hansworth level two will know that um, we do have two types of places. You can have right places where you do hand and back and then move and do hand and back in your new place. Or you can have wrong places which go back and hand. So here we have another look at the Cambridge and you can see that alternate items in the place notation are crosses. But as I was saying, some methods have wrong places, made backstroke and handstroke. And where right places follow wrong places or vice versa, a full stop is used to separate the two changes. And this is so you don't think that all those numbers apply to one change. So this is London minor, London surprise minor, and the place notation for that starts 36 cross 36 dot 14. So because it starts with a, a numerical place notation rather than starting with a cross like the Cambridge, this means that the bells and the first one are actually doing wrong places and then they cross and then three six are wrong places and then a dot and then the one four are right places. I realize that's a way beyond um, what some people are ringing at the moment. Um, but this is just an example, just so you can see what the place notation is intended to mean. Here's an example of some place notation in the diary. As you can see, we have the column of figures and we have the blue line and the trebles path marked out and the place notation in a column down the left. Here's an example of the same method, which is Bristol, but a little bit clearer. And you can see that the, we start with a cross and then a five eight and then a cross, then one four and then five eight. 
So if we were writing that out horizontally, we would have to put a dot after the one four and before the five eight in order to show that those place notations re uh, re um, refer to different changes. And you can actually see there's a block in the middle which goes five eight, three six, one four. So that would be shown as five eight dot three six dot one four. Now we're going to have a go at writing out a method using place notation. And I've chosen little Bob minor. And I've chosen this because it's, it's got a short lead end because the treble only goes up to fourth place. If that doesn't make much sense to you at the moment, it will do when we've, had a, uh, when we've been through it. The place notation for little Bob is cross one six, cross one four, with a lead end of one two. So I put the place notation at the top of each slide so we can see what we're looking for. And like with all methods, we're starting off with rounds. So first, everybody crosses. We have an X. So the one and the two swap, the three and the four swap, and the five and the six swap. Next, we have one six. So the bells that lead and in six stay put. So the two stays lead and the five stays lying behind. Pairs of bells in between cross. So the one and the four cross and the three and the six cross. Next, we have all cross again. Then we have one four. So the bells that lead and the bell in fourth stay put. Note that the bell in fourth is the treble. And the other two pairs of bells swap. So the two and the six swap in two, three in seconds and thirds and the three and the five swap over at the back. Now we've run out of place notation here. So we have to go back. We've been going from left to right, cross one six, cross one four. But that one four is the half lead. It's where the treble is making its place and is turning around to go back towards the front. So we now have to go backwards along the place notation. So we reverse along the line and we have a cross, so everybody crosses again. Then we do the one six again, so we have the six at lead, the three lying behind, the two pairs of bells in the middle swapping. Then we have another cross, which gets us with the treble, is now back down to lead, and that is the treble's hand stroke lead. So now we use that lead end notification of one, two, the treble leads, the six makes seconds, and the other two pairs of bells swap. So you can see when we talk about a lead of a method, we're talking about the treble going out towards the back. But in this case, it's plain hunting. It's plain hunting out as far as fourth place and then going back down to lead. And so that is a lead of a method. It's the time taken for the treble one to be leading on one time to the next time that the treble is leading. And in both cases now, the top row and the bottom row both represent the treble's backstroke lead. So the treble is leading at handstroke and backstroke, and we're specifically now looking at the backstroke leads. And this gives us of something very useful called lead ends. We start off with rounds and at the end of the first lead we've got one six four five two three. So those that's again the treble's backstroke lead. The six is now in seconds place, the four is now in thirds place, the five is now in fourths place, the two is now in fifths place and the three is now in sixth place. And we can use this information to work out what the next lead end will be. So if we look at the first pair, we see that the bell that is second in that change is the six. So then we look and see which bell is in sixth place there, which is the three, and that will be the bell that is second at the next lead end. 
So looking at the, again, at the line from the end of the first lead, the bell that is third is the four. So look at the bell which is four in that row, which is the five, and that will be third in the row at the end of the next lead. So then look at the bell which is in fourth. So the bell that's in fourth place in the second row is the five. So look at the bell that is fifth in that row, which is the two, and that is now fourth in the row at the bottom. Okay. Now look at the bell which is fifth in the second row. It's the two. So now look at the bell that's second in that row. It's the sixth. And that now bell is now going to be fifth in the row at the bottom. Then in the second row, the bell that's in sixth place is the three. So look at the bell which is third in that row. It's the fourth, the four. So that bell is now going to be six in sixth place in the row at the bottom. I hope that's not too complicated for people. I think it's worth people perhaps having a look at that themselves um, at another time. But if we keep doing that and following the same pattern, we can write out the whole the whole course, the lead ends for the whole course of Little Bob. And you'll see that five leads gets us back to rounds again. The treble is always leading at the lead end by definition. Each of the working bells ends up in a different place at each lead. I realise people are not ringing Little Bob yet, but it, this is just to get some basic principles that most methods work like this. Each bell rings each lead in turn. And if we look at the column, let's look at the second column, the column with the two at the top, and look at the numbers going down that column. It goes two, six, three, five, four. Now let us go to the third column, find the two, which is on the fourth row, and go down that column and then up to the top again. And we go two, six, three, then it's the three at the top, five, four. Go to the fourth column, find the two, goes two, six, three, four, up to the top again, then five. And it's the same with the fifth and sixth columns as well. The order of the bells down the column is the same in each column. So we have seen that all the working bells take their turn at ringing each lead. And here we can see how that fits together. First again, check and look how that red one never gets beyond fourth place. Now look at the orange two. Follow the orange twos to the bottom where it ends in fifth place. Now go to the top of that column where you find the blue fives and follow the blue fives down to the bottom. You'll end in fourth place. Now go to the top, find the dark green fours and follow them down to the bottom and you will end in thirds. Go to the top of that column, follow the light green threes down to the bottom and you'll end in sixths. Go to the top of that column and follow the purple sixes and you will end in seconds. So in fact, you may have been wondering before why we didn't write out the whole course, why we only wrote out one lead. And the answer is that actually it's a grid and that in, you can write, you can work out what any bell is doing and what the whole length of the course just from one lead of the method. Here is a circle of the place, place the, the starts for the method. So second place bell becomes fifth place bell, becomes fourth place bell, becomes third place bell, becomes sixth place bell and so on round the circle. So when we talk about fifth place bell, we just mean that the bell is doing the work 
that the five started by doing at the very beginning when we started from rounds. So how do we use place notation at the Birmingham School? Well, I use a bit of place notation at Handsworth at level two, three to introduce plain hunt. And I do this by putting people in a line and giving them a number. And I expect most of you have done this at some time, if not with me at Handsworth, then somewhere else, perhaps with Chris Mills. Each person says their number in turn, then everyone swaps in pairs and they say their number again. Then the first and last they put and the internal pairs swap and they say their number. And you keep repeating these alternate um, items of everybody swapping and internal pair swapping until you get back to rounds. Another way you could do it is to each ring a handbell. And this is quite a useful demonstration for people of how plain hunt works. And I have also used it at times to demonstrate coursing orders, coursing but course bells, but that's a different talk altogether, which somebody else is giving. So at the moment, we're not getting our ringing, are we? Uh, we're in lockdown and we need to find ways of keeping our learning going. And one of the things we can do here is to have a go at doing a method using place notation. And I suggest for this that you get six playing cards and you lay them on the table and use the place notation of plain hunt to ring it. Now, the place notation for plain hunt is on six, is cross one six. So this is effectively what I was talking about on the previous slide. The cross is everybody swapping, and the one six is the first and last bells staying in put, and the internal pairs swapping. And then you repeat this until you get back to rounds. And this will take you 12 changes. And I suggest you write down each row as you go. Once you've done that, you could try, when the treble gets back to leading, try one two place notation instead of one six. You'll then need to repeat the whole sequence four more times in order to get back to rounds. And that will give you 60 changes. Another thing you could do then is when you get back, when you get to the 60th change, use one four as your place notation instead of one two and repeat the whole sequence two more times, which will give you 180 changes. Then when you get to your 180th change and you're due to get back to rounds, use the place notation one, two, three, four. That actually means that four of the bells have to stay in the same place and only the bells in fifth and sixth place swap and then repeat again. And that will give you 360 changes. Now you may wonder what that's all about. Well, as I said, cross one six repeated is just plain hunt on six. But if you use one two when the treble is leading, that actually gives you plain bob minor. If you use the one four instead of the one two, that actually is a bob. And if you use one two three four instead of one two, that's a single. So place notation, I think here, can give people an understanding of what bobs and singles are and how they work. It is really a, just a change in the place notation for one change. So to summarise, change ringing has been evolving over the last 400 years and the means of recording methods has needed to evolve as well as methods have got more complicated and we've wanted to use other sort of um, devices such as computers as well as Carter's ringing machine in order to be able to um, describe a method. So it's a useful tool for defining methods and we can also use it to uh, develop our own understanding of how methods work. I've put together here a little bibliography of, the, of some of the books I've used in compiling this presentation. I have to say that the Whiting Society website is one I hadn't come across before, and it's a really good source of old historic books. Um, the others, I have to say, uh, the Place Notation by Morris, that was available online as well, as was the Learning Curve um, article from The Ringing World and John Carter's Setting Book Notes. Um, 
Ringworld Diary, Campanello Jack Improved, and Wilson and the Nine Tailors are all ones I happen to have at home. So any questions, if you'd like to put them in the chat box. Okay, well, um, that's, uh, that was in incredibly interesting, uh, uh, Janet. I have to say that although to many of you, I might seem like quite an advanced ringer, but um, I think that things like the theory of things like place notation, they're sort of in my head, but they're pretty much of a jumble. Um, but Janet has done an extremely good job of actually uh, unravelling all of that for me. So I now feel actually quite confident that I might even be able to explain it to somebody. Um, so does anybody have any questions that they'd, they'd like to ask? If you can use the raise hand facility, which I can't remember where it is. It's on, uh, I'm going to unmute Orson because he'll be able to tell me where. <laughs> where, where the, where's the raise hand facility, Orson? Oh. So, uh, well, there's two ways you can do it. In the, in the part, if you click participants, there's an option called raise hand yeah. and that'll make your hand go up otherwise you otherwise there's a reaction you can do thank you also or, or you can just use reactions excellent well i'm going to use reactions anyway just to give janet a round of applause but um uh, uh, so does anybody have any questions struck dumb <laughs> I've actually I have unmuted everybody so that you can unmute yourself if you're not if you aren't muted. Okay. Well, so apart from um, uh, any questions, does anybody have any comments? Has, it, has anybody got, uh, say, Tony or Phil or Simon to add to anything that uh, that um, Janet has? Well, it'll be handy for me because I'm doing next week's and it'll pick up nicely from that in some respects as well. So it's nice, it's nice to see where the joining point is. So and it, that, would, um, that would benefit from a wider audience if it could be um, recorded without an audience, with all, uh, which makes it better for recording. And then it put into the art programme of webinars would be good. And that's, that's very interesting, that one. Well, yeah, very, very much so. I'm currently working on a, on a call change presentation, which will be made into a, a video as well. Um, I, and I, so, Janet, if you're happy, I'll, I'll, uh, I, we can discuss that later if you're, yeah, if you're happy yeah. for that to be archived. And, and also, don't forget that um, Mark Eccleston is archiving all of our sessions that we've had and getting the resources together, like the, the, the presentations that have been uh, being given and they're being put onto the Guild website as well. Just to make a comment, Roz took me through some of this the other week, this is Stella, and um, she was saying that I think you'd said, Roz, that when Tim was learning frequently as a band, um, they were given the place notation, you know, and asked to basically go and convert it to a lead themselves, you know, as a way of learning. So, Roz, you've got your hand up, so perhaps, uh, but you are muted there. Can you unmute and respond? Please, Clayley. Oh, I have to unmute you. Oh. oh. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, it wasn't Tim, it was an older ringer, somebody who's now about 70. And uh, it was before the days when anybody had a computer, obviously. So they were given a tiny scrap of paper with the place notation on, and they had to write it all out and learn the blue line for the following week. And I actually think that is a wonderful way of getting people to interact with a method. It, it was common when peel bands were organized by phone calls that people yes. would just hated the place notation. Yeah. And they had to work out what the method was themselves. Yes. And I've been trying to do that recently. Rather than looking at a printed blue line and memorising it, which I find very difficult, I've been writing methods out from place notation. And somehow that deeper way of going into a method is helping it to make an awful lot more sense. So if you are already learning methods and you want to learn more methods, I would really recommend that you have a go. Just look at the place notation in, uh, on a website, but don't look at the method 
write it all out and see if you can get it right. And then you'll see why a bell is dodging for ages at the front. And it's because the places behind it are, are making that happen. It, it, somehow it just seems to make the method make sense. It's something that Tony has been saying for <coughs> ages in different training courses I've gone to. And Phil, don't just look at the blue line. Look at the way the method is put together. And that putting together is all there in the place notation. Yeah, I think that that's one of the things uh, Janet said early on was was that it's the it's the bells that stand still that dictate what the what the uh, what the other bells do. So uh, I yes. sometimes used to put a make a little analogy for something like playing Bob doubles. The why the reason why uh, uh, the dodges happen is because when uh, when the second gets back to lead in plain hunt and uh, and uh, um, starts to come out from the back as the treble leads. But it's a little, a little bit like it's uh, the, the the second has been it's been shocking somewhere. It goes goes out. And it's it, it's, it's paid, paid for paid for fuel in the garage if you like. Goes out, then realises they've left their credit card in the shop. They have to go back. So so they turn around and go back into the shop. But that means that all the other people queuing at the petrol pump can't go into the shop to pay. So they've got to spend time doing something else, which causes the dodges. So people have to step back or stay in the place, same place for longer. So, uh, yes, I, I've sometimes come up with little analogies like that. Now, I mean, if, if you've got places being made, it depends whether it's a place in an even place or an odd place, whether you either dodge or plain hunt above or below it. I didn't want to go into that in too much because... Uh, I felt that a lot of the people on here wouldn't be ringing methods of that degree of complexity, but you can have, there is a sort of a rule that if you, if you, um, if there's an odd place, then you, you dodge under an odd place and you dodge over an even place. I think I've got that the right way around, <laughs> but yes. I, I didn't include that in the, in the um, presentation because I felt that was probably a step too far for for what people were doing and and I would say don't worry if, if you're not um, if you're not method ringing at the moment or, or if you're still at an early stage this is an interesting sort of exercise to, to do actually uh, if uh, well if you uh, if you're not too busy baking or something like that you know, and uh, while we've got, while we can't be ringing, it's a, an interesting exercise to actually get your head around how how methods work, and even try inventing your own methods. Perhaps some of you might decide to to have a go at at doing some of this and invent your own methods. But just by having a, sort of that simple place notation, you might find that you've invented one that's already been invented. But <laughs> however you might find that you've invented a, a, a really a, a really new a, a completely new one uh, uh, and in which case and I'm sure uh, the, the people who are uh, who know about composing methods would uh, would be able to sort of verify this there, uh, there, there are probably ways of of making them musical as well so but I, that's that's something that uh, so, so the, the, the composers of methods must have a system of knowing which which what things will make a method more musical or easier to ring than other methods. So, I, I think one of the things when people get later on into bobs and singles, and this is one of the things I was saying really at the end with writing out plain bob minor. I mean, really, a bob or a single is just place notation is different just for one single change. Um, and uh, people get very hung up on it. And I think knowing that it's just different place notation for one change, I think can help people's um, understanding of bobs and singles. It might not necessarily make it any easier for them to ring at the time, but I think in terms of understanding what's going on, I think it's quite useful. Excellent. So mm -hmm. has anybody else got any more questions or comments? No, I don't fully understand it right now, but um, I'll have to have a, a, a longer look at it to, to get it into my head, I think. 
Well, I think that's very true. Use pen and paper. I think that's very true about lots of things. I've been writing on this anyway. <laughs> yeah. that's well, not, not understanding something straight away is very, very true about lots of things about bell ringing. And I think that even things that you do understand now, uh, like, for instance, if you know how to ring call changes, um, and you, you sort of say six months time, twelve months time, when you've done more things and uh, and got uh, and learnt more things, perhaps ventured into method ringing, you might look back on what you've done with call changes and some and 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 suddenly just think, well, actually, I remember so and so telling me about that, and oh, now I understand it. So you don't always have to have a, a full understanding of something, or or to be able to sort of like just pluck it, sort of subconsciously know it or know it so well that you, that, uh, you know, it, it's there. But it, you, you can look back and think, oh, yeah, I remember that, uh, that uh, session with um, Janet and now I can see what she was saying. So don't think of it, if you haven't understood everything today, don't think of it as, uh, as beyond you or, or wasted time or anything because it will be, it, it can be useful later. Hello? Oh, right. Okay. Okay, so if nobody has any more questions, I'd really like to thank Janet for such an interesting presentation. I mean, sometimes history and uh, and the theory of ringing could be is it can be viewed as a little dry. However, I think she's made it an, a, a really interesting, uh, captivating um, session and. Um, uh, uh, and, and must be so because uh, obviously uh, Simon was requesting that uh, that this could be used elsewhere. And there's lots of this going on, on around all, all over the country that people are coming up with really good resources. So we've got our ears to the ground for those things. And if we can get hold of some of those things, I did. Somebody recommended to me um, somebody to maybe do a talk about Devon call changes. So I might be trying to get somebody to to come and have a talk, a, a visiting presenter perhaps. So. Yeah. Um, I know who do that. Yeah, well, uh, so it's, it's John Bint who's been re recommended to me. Okay. But, but uh, yeah, so so we'll be working on that. And obviously there'll be another session next week. And I think there's going to be a session on Wednesday as well. Uh, just leaves me uh, just a, a few seconds to be able to advertise the Guild Bake Off, of course. <laughs> so if, if you haven't heard about the Guild Bake Off, look out for your emails, look on the Facebook page. Uh, it, the Bake Off is, get, is taking place, you, you've got until the 2nd of May to get your Bake Off entries in. Uh, have just had a Bake Off entry come in today and they said, haven't got any flour. So they've managed to do it without flour. So that's so wow. not having flour is not an excuse. <laughs> oh dear. Um, we've also... Oh, we'll also see a lot of flapjacks. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> we've also had uh, two, donate, two anonymous donations to to the Bake Off. Yeah. Um, so even if you don't want to vote, don't want to enter, you can still make a donation to the charity that we're, 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 uh, we're uh, raising money for. So, uh, which is the um, <coughs> uh, Solihull Hospice for Macmillan Cancer. So, um, so with that, more ado. If, if, oh, Claire, yeah. Claire yeah. Curie. one thing. Some people are putting things in the chat. Um, yeah asking me questions. I've just tried to respond to them, but I think I've only responded to individual people. Okay. People want to drop me an email. My email address is janet.horton, so that's quite easy to remember, at virgin.net. That's janet.horton at virgin.net. Uh, yeah, so Stella has just um, corrected me. Our, our cancer charity is, uh, is uh, Marie Curie, not Macmillan. Either way, it's still a good charity. Can I also just add as well, with regards next week's session, um, it's, it's aimed at well, anybody who's on the screen today, actually. Obviously, people who are sort of at the elementary end of, of change ringing, but even people who, who are still yet to start off. Methods or anything like that, and it's not about learning methods, it's about how to learn methods. Yes, so the, the program of, of uh, learning sessions that we're putting together 
generally on a Saturday morning, they're going to be aimed at anybody who is, uh, is uh, working towards um, any of the levels of the Learning the Ropes uh, programmes, so levels one to level five. Uh, and the Wednesday evening sessions are going to be slight, uh, will either be a bit more advanced than that, but it doesn't mean to say you can't drop in and have a listen, uh, or it might be about other subjects. So, uh, so Arthur was uh, has already presented uh, a session on on how we learn, not not how to learn, not how to learn, but how we do learn. So that was an interesting session as well. So, uh, so a bit more, so different sort of levels of uh, of complex. Are, are, are the different times, but everybody's welcome to, uh, to all, the, all of the sessions. Um, now, I, 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 uh, I, uh, we have for, we've had 30 people participating today, which is great. Um, obviously, this is probably not the, the, you're not probably not the audience to say, did you all get the email? Because you obviously did. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we, there, was, there was there was one uh, one person who well, it was here who was included on the original email but didn't get it. So that was what I was driving at. So if you as as long as uh, we've got a good. Uh, uh, it, it came from a different source, so it wasn't the school email that was sent it out. So it was the guild's email address that was sending the invitation. So, um, if, well, should you find out that anybody has missed out on the email, do let me know, or or let them, or forward the email to somebody if you if you think they haven't had it. But it's going out to a wide, uh, uh, it's going out to the, uh, the all of the guild membership the invitation to join the session. Okay. So if, uh, if everybody's happy, happy, then I'll close the meeting. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Susan. Bye. 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 See you next week. Yeah.